I think we'll start now. Yes, so hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Norhan Al-Shahabi, a MAPA intern and a UMass Boston graduate student. Uh, the, I, before I start, the, the mission of MAPA is to promote peaceful US foreign policy. The topic of discussion will be about the political and economic situation of Lebanon. We will also be touching up on many other points related to Lebanon. Uh, I would also like to thank journalist and political activist Rania Khalet for joining us today to talk about Lebanon. Rania, if you would like to start us off, you could. Sure. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I know Lebanon is a bit of like a confusing mess for a lot of people because it seems like a really complicated place. Um, it's currently obviously going through this horrible economic collapse where the uh, infrastructure of the country is completely deteriorating. People don't have electricity. Um, you know, I always like to say just even me, like I'm someone who is lucky, right? I have a job outside of the country. Um, I don't have to worry about not being paid in dollars yet. I still only get about 14 hours of electricity a day, completely dependent on my building generator, which I'm lucky to have. So that's how lucky people in Lebanon are living. Most of the population is getting like two to four hours of electricity from the state every day. Cause the electricity sector has just completely collapsed. Inflation is out of control. The Local currency has lost more than 90% of its value in the last two years. For the 60% of people that were getting paid in Lira, uh, that means that their salaries went, you know, just completely uh, decreased like tremendously. I mean, somebody who was making a few thousand dollars a month in Lira two years ago is now making like under a hundred dollars a month. Um, so you can imagine what the situation is like for most of the people. The middle class is just disappearing. People are leaving the country if they can. There's a complete political deadlock and a, a crisis as a result of that. And I mean, just to give people an idea of why this is happening, you know, I know you wanted me to talk about the uprising in Lebanon um, that took place in October of 2019. And I noticed you used the word revolution. Um, and I actually don't think the term revolution is accurate. And the reason I say that is because uh, Revolution means something. And what I would call what happened in October 2019 was a popular uprising. Uh, and it was very exciting for, for a few days in 2019. There was, uh, people came out into the streets very angry about the growing inequality in the country. It was provoked by this new tax they called on, you know, they were going to place on WhatsApp. Um, and you saw people really across class lines and across sect lines for the first time and in the modern history of Lebanon really come together and say like enough is enough, um, we're done. But the reason I call it a popular uprising instead of a revolution is because I think it's kind of impossible to have a revolution without a revolutionary ideology. And this particular uprising, you know, while the revolutionary potential was certainly there, right, with many legitimate grievances, the poor and middle class who came out were very quickly used by political elites who wanted to replace other political elites <laughs> with themselves. And so and this is nothing unique to Lebanon, by the way. It's not a unique phenomenon to Lebanon. These sort of like leaderless, spontaneous uprisings of angry, disaffected people, kind of like realizing their future is going to be worse than their past is something I think we've seen around the world, particularly in recent years with this sort of decay of neoliberalism. Uh, particularly, you know, not just in the global South, but in the global North as well. Um, but over and over, we also see that when there is no coherent ideology behind it, and in the case of Lebanon, no coherent ideology was ever allowed to develop behind it, it's very quickly seized upon by, you know, Western NGOs and like local right-wingers for their own aims. So even if in the beginning of this uprising, um, you know, it was angry people who had a right to be angry. That's just not the case now. You know, two years later, what began as this uprising has turned into a bunch of opposition parties that have formed made up of upper middle class liberals and, you know, basically pro imperialists who openly meet with Western embassies. So that's what happened with the 2019 uprising. And I'll be even more specific. I mean, within the first two to three days of that uprising, there was this genuine expression of grievances against the inequalities I talked about. Uh, and I would argue in many ways, it was actually like the lead, the like the sort of forefront of those first two to three days was actually pro Hezbollah youth um, who were like on their motorcycles and starting roadblocks and fires in the road. 
Um, but it was ultimately hijacked by the Lebanese forces party first, who was run by this war criminal called Samir Jaja, uh, who two, three days into this uprising declared his support for it and, and, and actually removed his uh, Lebanese forces ministers from the government. And then all these Lebanese forces people came out into the streets. And then all these future movement people came out into the streets. And just so you, you know, people get confused about Lebanon. There's all these political parties. So let me just like explain what I mean by those parties uh, very quickly, because it's kind of important to understanding the political landscape in Lebanon. So back in 2005, which was a pivotal year for Lebanon, it's the year that Afil Hariri, the former prime minister, was assassinated. It's the year of the so-called Cedar Revolution, which we now know was actually an American project <laughs> guided by America using local proxies to push for ending the Syrian presence in Lebanon. Um, and this is when you have the formation of two political, major political alliance that dominate the Lebanese political scene until today. So one of those alliances is the pro-American, pro-Saudi March 14 alliance led by the future movement, the Progressive Socialist Party, which is neither progressive nor socialist, so don't be confused by that, and the Lebanese Forces Party, which I mentioned earlier. And then the other alliance was the March 18, or I'm sorry, the March 8th alliance. And this is led by Hezbollah, by ML, and another uh, Shia political party, and then by a Christian political party called FPM, the Free Patriotic Movement. And this is when Hezbollah entered the Lebanese government for the first time, uh, with members of its political wing being elected to parliament as a part of this massive coalition, the March 8th, 8th coalition. Uh, and this is, of course, was significant because this is when the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Israel were like, absolutely not. Like, we can't have Hezbollah in Lebanon. And so from then on, the meddling and the proxies, and there was even a war in 2006 by Israel, you know, against Lebanon, but really it was against Hezbollah. Um, you know, the, this, but this alliance still exists uh, in Lebanon today. Uh, and this alliance, like I mentioned, it dominates the, the political scene uh, in every way possible. But then you also have this new alliance that comes out of the uprising I mentioned, this, this like uh, these opposition groups that all honestly don't really like each other that much. And like I mentioned before, like those first few days, it was really great, but it was very quickly twisted by the presence of NGOs and the March 14 political parties I just mentioned, very quickly hijacked that uprising to push it into, you know, to push it into their agenda and to turn it into essentially an anti-Hezbollah uprising. And that's ultimately what ended up happening. Hezbollah supporters actually left. They stopped being a part of it because Nasrallah, we gave a speech and he told them, you know, I, I don't want you guys to be a part of this protest anymore. So they removed themselves from it. That's not to say there was no one good left. There was also groups of like leftist parties still involved trying to guide it in the right direction, but ultimately that didn't work. And now you have a bunch of groups, you know, I can name them, but it doesn't really matter because no one's going to know who I'm talking about. But there are a bunch of groups that are basically, you know, pro West, pro like very anti Hezbollah, and they openly meet with embassies, like particularly the German embassy. And I can talk a little bit more about some of the foreign influence in Lebanon, the Germans being one of the biggest ones at the moment. Um, but that's basically that. I don't know if you'd like me to actually go into, in conjunction to this uprising, there was something else happening, which was the economic collapse. Um, maybe that would be like a good place to start to explain why there was an economic collapse in Lebanon. Um, now, you know, a lot of the mainstream media you watch will say, oh, there's an economic collapse in Lebanon because of corruption and greed. Lebanon is just this horribly corrupt country. And Lebanon is a horribly corrupt country. Like there's no doubt about that. Um, however, Lebanon has been horribly corrupt since the end of the civil war and even before that. But the system that was set up in Lebanon that's very, very corrupt and that bankrupted the country has existed for 30 years. So it's not like suddenly Lebanon became corrupt and took a nosedive. I wanna be very clear, there is a hybrid war right now on Lebanon and this economic collapse while it wasn't necessarily caused by somebody else entirely, it's a part of that hybrid war. And so let me explain what I mean by that, because I know that sounds a little confusing. But basically, after the civil war in Lebanon, there was a system that was set up by two people in particular that were very instrumental. It was a Ponzi scheme economic system set up by the Fil Hariri, who is the father of Saad Hariri, who is the for both pri former prime ministers of Lebanon. And Saad Hariri is the leader of the future party, which is a part of the March 14 Alliance. So you have Rafi al Hariri and somebody that he hired uh, called Riyad Salemi to be the head of the central bank. 
And these two individuals with the complicity of the rest of the political class in Lebanon set up a Ponzi scheme economy that was essentially dependent on a constant inflow of money from outside of the country to basically fund the country's imports. And they created an entire banking system around this. There's a huge bank, you know, Lebanon before the economic collapse, it was known as like the banking capital of the Middle East. Um, that's where everybody put their money. Um, and a lot of this money actually came from Lebanese expatriates because as we know, the Lebanese diaspora, many of them are quite successful in various parts of the world. And so it was like kind of advertised to them as, as like, you know, you left the country, but do your patriotic duty and put your money here. And you'll, you know, actually make money off of your money with these really high interest rates. And so that that worked for a number of years, but like any Ponzi scheme, eventually it, it's going to collapse. Um, and over the years, that's what it started to do. It started to collapse. But there's something very important to also understand about creating an economy that is basically dependent on a constant inflow of dollars on Western capital to fund your country is you leave your country vulnerable to the whims of outside powers who control the dollar. And so over the last, I would say maybe, you know, really starting with the war um, with, well, maybe I, I would say it started a couple of years before this, but basically with the war on Syria is when you started to see some capital leaving the country. Um, be, partly because Hezbollah was involved in that war, Syria was next to Lebanon. Part of the reason Lebanon didn't collapse around that time is because Syrians actually, like rich Syrians, took their money out of Syrian banks and put them to Lebanese banks. So that capital from Syrian banks actually kept the Lebanese banking system going for a little while longer. Um, and then came, uh, I think you'll remember, like over as these years were going on, like you saw a lot of disinvestment from Lebanon. Saudi Arabia was completely funding the future party a completely funding Saad Hariri. And at some point they just decided, you know what? Like funding proxies isn't working. We've tried to start civil wars in Lebanon through our proxies. It's not working. Hezbollah is still strong. Hezbollah is still in government. We're just going to take our capital out of Lebanon. Like we're going to stop funding things in Lebanon. And, you know, Saudi Arabia is kind of like the leader of the Gulf states. So when Saudi Arabia does that, tells the Gulf states to do it, Lebanon uses a huge source of tourism, which were a lot of people from the Gulf states used to come to Lebanon. They don't anymore. That like that was a huge revenue stream lost for Lebanon. And then the Saudi disinvestment, because Saudi over the years with this Ponzi scheme, Lebanon would have economic problems and Saudi Arabia and France and these other countries would come bail out Lebanon. But they decided to stop doing that. And then we get to 2017, Saudi Arabia, you might remember, kidnapped the Lebanese prime minister. Um, Assad Hariri and forced him, they tortured him and forced him to resign because they wanted to bring down the Lebanese government because they felt Hezbollah was too powerful. This of course didn't work, but it's amazing how little coverage this got in terms of how shocking it was. Like Jamal Khashoggi was cut up, it was like a dissident who was, you know, murdered in a really cruel way by Saudi Arabia. But I actually think the kidnapping of the Lebanese prime minister was actually, it was more insane. Um, what happened is Jamal Khashoggi is awful, but countries do murder dissidents. It happened like crazy countries, tyrannical countries murder dissidents. They kidnapped a sitting prime minister and forced him to resign. I actually can't think of that ever happening. Um, but anyways, and then 2018 comes along, there's elections, Hezbollah's coalition wins a majority. And this is also happening as Trump is president in the backdrop of Mike Pompeo pushing this maximum pressure campaign. This administration viewed Hezbollah as like basically a branch of Iran, Hezbollah basically is Iran. So the maximum pressure campaign that's applied to Iran also applies to Hezbollah in their view. And this is when it, this is when people start pulling their money out of Lebanon. This is when Lebanon gets desperate for money. Riyad Salemi, the central bank governor, who was a very good ally of the West, I should say, uh, like raises, like starts offering these insane interest rates to try to get more capital into the country because he sees the writing on the wall. And this starts to alert people like nobody, like these interest rates were crazy high, like 5%, 10%. Just for comparison, like at a New York bank, you get like 1.5% and that's pretty good. So imagine 5%, 10% interest rates if you just put your money in a Lebanese bank. And people who were smart and had money were like, something's shady here. You don't offer that unless something bad's about to happen. So it actually increases people moving their money out of Lebanon. And then come 2019, Lebanon's broke, but nobody knows it yet. And then the uprising happens. And 
at the same time, like I remember a month before the October uprising, I went to go try to take dollars out of the ATM because in Lebanon, you used to be able to just take dollars out of the ATM and I couldn't find dollars in any ATM. And so it started before the uprising. Then the uprising happens and the banks use this as an, op- as an opportunity to shut their doors. And then everything just, you know, like, I don't know if I can curse, but like everything just goes to, <laughs> everything goes terribly. The economy starts collapsing. Everyone's like, oh no, like the banks are like, sorry, you can't get your money. There's like, so there, there's no run on the banks. And that's where we are today. But I want to be very clear about this issue of corruption. Cause like the people that I'm talking about who architected this system are the allies of the West. They are people who were allowed to have this system, who made a huge profit off of this system and who were enabled by Western countries. A few years before the Lebanese economy collapsed, Riyad Salami was getting awards at international financial institutions. Um, so, I mean, when we talk about corruption in Lebanon, there is an attempt now to use this to try to like blame Hezbollah or something, but Hezbollah, you know, we can talk about that. Hezbollah is allied with corrupt parties, but they are not even a part of the Lebanese bank manging system, they weren't a part of it because they're under sanction. So even if they wanted to be, they couldn't be. So they're, they don't, they did not play a role in this economic collapse, but now this economic collapse is being used as a part of this hybrid war against Lebanon in conjunction with sanctions on various individuals of the country, as well as the ongoing funding of proxy uh, forces uh, in this country by the Saudis, by a little bit less by the US these days, but by the Germans who are just like all over the place, funding a lot of these new opposition parties and openly meeting with them and just trying to like push their agenda in Lebanon, which is obviously anti-resistance, anti-Hezbollah, anti-Iran. and obviously the French, <laughs> um, and it goes on and on and on. So it's, you know, I know you wanted me to talk about like how people in this uprising in October 19 were like against foreign intervention. And I think that was like a general sentiment, but I don't even think that was really on people's minds in those first few days. I think the thing that was really on their minds, of course they, they want a sovereign country, they don't want intervention, but they just wanted a better future. And they felt like their futures were going to be worse than their past. And they were right about that. And so that's what people were protesting. But now, you know, sometimes when you hear in Lebanon, we don't want foreign intervention, it's oftentimes coming from people who say we don't want Iranian occupation. There's this entire like right wing funded campaign to claim that that Iran is occupying Lebanon. I've never seen the Iranians occupying Lebanon. Like if anything, right now, Saudi Arabia is helping to crash the Lebanese economy further uh, by, uh, completely divesting from Lebanon and cutting off imports and exports between Lebanon and Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf states to like really like decapitate Lebanon while it's already on its knees, uh, all because they wanted to force the resignation of Lebanon's information minister for criticizing the war in Yemen, um, or that's the pretext they use. So if there's foreign intervention in Lebanon, like I haven't seen any, any existence of Iranian foreign intervention. I, what I've seen is the existence of a lot of U.S. intervention, the U.S. ambassador here is constantly opening, openly meddling in the country's affairs. The Germans who are constantly not just funding these sort of civil society and NGO groups uh, and media, but are also, um, you know, constantly like meeting with really right wing, awful figures that want like to do damage to Lebanon, basically just like sort of treacherous figures in the country. Um and the Saudis who are funding the fascistic Lebanese forces party and are just, they want like a war in Lebanon. They want Lebanon to burn. Um, so that that's what I see in this country. Um, and it's just, you know, it's the thing is though, the, this hybrid war trying to basically eradicate any resistance to imperial dictates in Lebanon, it hasn't worked. And because it hasn't worked, Lebanon, I think, is going to continue to be subjected to these kinds of tactics that we see used on countries like Iran and Venezuela and Syria. I would like to add actually something to that. I definitely agree with this, all of the points that you stated. I would say, okay, Iran, I'm not like, I'm not going to point fingers because everyone has a piece in Lebanon right now, whether it's the US or Saudi Arabia. I mean, you can see right now how Saudi Arabia and all the UAE countries are basically saying, okay, you can't come here anymore. No, we're just basically dropping everything. You can't come here. But Iran, to an extent, maybe has not directly had, let's say, someone there. 
I mean, I could argue from, let's say, look at uh, um, Hassan Nasrallah from the 80s when he did have an interview with Jibran Twaini. And he was saying, you know, my, my ultimate plan is to make Lebanon an extension of Iran. Like that was his ultimate goal. His ideology in itself is not necessarily saying, oh, like I want like I want Lebanon to be independent, but I want Lebanon to be an extension of Iran as an Islamic state. I just wanted to point that out because it is it is said in one of his interviews in the 80s. So not just and not pointing fingers at him. Oh, he's like to blame for everything that's happening in Lebanon because he's not the only person to blame. I'm just saying that to an extent right now, it's also giving this kind of excuse for like other countries, let's say the United States and Saudi Arabia to say, oh, okay, let's let's go into Lebanon because he's gonna he's about to ruin it and he's about to turn turn it around for everyone. So I don't I actually I wouldn't think that that gives them an excuse. They don't need an excuse to go into Lebanon. And I, I you know, when it comes to Hezbollah, we have to be honest about what Hezbollah has done for Lebanon. Hezbollah is not just Lebanon for, for the region. Um, a few things. Hezbollah obviously was a bit of a different organization in the 80s. Uh, it's a much different, I would say, organization now in the way that it deals with the rest of the country. They're not trying to impose anything on the country. I, I think Hezbollah is a partner of Iran in the region against U.S. and Saudi and Israeli hegemony. Hezbollah is the only force in the Middle East that has ever liberated any land from Israel. Uh, and that made it a very popular group um, across sects across the region, particularly after 2000, when they kicked the Israelis out of southern Lebanon. And after 2006, when they once again kicked the Israelis out, and we have to understand some of the war on the region, like after the Israelis kicked Israel out of Lebanon in that war in 2000, I'm sorry, after Hezbollah kicked the Israelis out in 2006, we know for a fact that Dick Cheney and the former intelligence chief of the Saudis, uh, Prince Bondar, launched this plan to essentially uh, spread anti-Shia hate across the region to try to diminish the popularity of Hezbollah and Iran because they were literally, I mean, like there was a poll taken in 2006 after the war and in like Egypt, uh, which is not a Shia country like at all. I don't even know if Egypt has Shias. <laughs> and one of the, they asked them like, who are the three most popular figures in this country or something? And Nasrallah came in the top three. Um, I don't think you'd see that today, but that's just to show like there was a fear uh, this group militarily was able to take on Israel and give them a bloody nose, and they're popular. And then Hezbollah has proven to be a force that has also protected Lebanon's borders, not just from Israel, but the war in Syria was a huge threat to Lebanon. The U.S., the Saudis, the Turks, the um, Qataris, uh, they spent a lot of money sending weapons to this collection of Salafi jihadist groups that in Syria that were meant to collapse the state, right? And Syria is Lebanon's neighbor. It's a huge neighbor. It's a very important neighbor. Um, and those, those rebel groups, those Salafi jihadist groups were also entering Lebanon and you know launching car bombs and killing people. Um, ISIS was in Lebanon, Al-Qaeda was in Lebanon. And the reason they were pushed out of Lebanon is because of Hezbollah, who also played a huge role in Syria uh, in helping the Syrian army uh, take back areas from these various rebel groups and preventing state collapse in that country. They've also played a role advising uh, people in Yemen who are fighting the Saudis, advising the Houthis in Yemen. So this is the problem with Hezbollah. This is what America and Saudi Arabia and Israel are upset about. And this is why, I mean, you could say that's why they're messing with Lebanon, but there's like the, the thing about Lebanon is it's, it's a question of, is, his, is, is Iran violating Lebanon's sovereignty? I have never seen any evidence of Iran telling Hezbollah what to do in Lebanon domestically. Again, they absolutely have a partnership across the region. There's no question, like I mentioned, Houthis in Yemen. They also work with the Hashda Shabi, the uh, PM, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq to, uh, to push out ISIS. And now they've, you know, they've kind of become a part of the resistance axis, as they call it. And in Syria, they also help the resistance in Palestine. Um, and so this is a part of, I mean, I, that's a part of the sort of like Iranian, I guess, block in the Middle East. And the whole part of that block isn't, I don't think, to make everything an Iranian satellite state, because I also don't see Iran pose, imposing its model of governance or its religion or anything on any other area. It's a matter of protecting the territorial borders and sovereignty of these countries 
from these imperialist powers that just want them to be like colonial satellite states to do their bidding. I mean, the US and Saudi Arabia, what do they want Lebanon to be? They want Lebanon to make peace with Israel. Um, and they want, you know, Lebanon to like basically just do whatever the US wants and have no choice or independence whatsoever. And the road to being an independent country is not easy. If you want to be an independent country, you are attacked. You are attacked like Venezuela is attacked. You are attacked like Syria is attacked. And in Lebanon, there is, it's not just like an attack through proxies. It's also the propaganda here. I mean, Lebanon is such a small country. There's what, 6 million people in this country. I think 2 million of them aren't even Lebanese. They're like refugees. It's such a tiny, tiny country. Yet the amount of satellite stations in this country, like funded by the Saudis and the UAE and the Qataris, it's, it's unbelievable. There's so much microscopic attention on this tiny little country. Like it even matters that much, not to diminish Lebanon, but come on, you're a tiny country. And a part of that is also to propagandize the population. And so there's an increasing polarization in Lebanon, depending on what media people watch. Sometimes that media is attached to various political parties. Sometimes it's, it's like attached to various oligarchs who are tied to political parties. But almost the entire, I would say like 95% of the media apparatus in Lebanon is actually anti-Hezbollah and funded, but a lot of it's funded by the outside. And so again, like that's my, what I'm saying, there's like, what does Hezbollah have? They have El Manar, they have Mayadeen. I, I mean, I don't even see Iranian TV stations here, like in Arabic. So it's just like, it doesn't compare. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no comparison between Iran's role in Lebanon, whatever it might be. I mean, they gave us free oil versus Saudi Arabia. That's like literally like imposed this blockade on Lebanon now. I agree um, with um, actually adding on to what. Syria in connection to Lebanon, I was wondering if you could bring up the topic of the Caesar sanctions. Yeah, so the Caesar sanctions, you know, okay, Lebanon is, again, like I said, a tiny country. It's bordered by Syria on one side, and then to the south, it's Israel-Palestine, and then the Mediterranean Sea. So that's like the Beirut port, which exploded last year. Um, and not as much can come through the Beirut port anymore. So that that border with Syria is very, very important for trade. Syria is a huge, should be a huge trading partner of Lebanon. It just like makes sense. But the Caesar sanctions are so drastic um, that they actually threaten anybody in neighboring countries who does business with Syria. And that includes Lebanon. So Lebanon can't get electricity from Syria anymore. And le- there's a lot of official trade that Lebanon has to basically apply for waivers to the U.S. Treasury to not be impacted by sanctions. But even then, these sanctions are so severe that like it's kind of like you don't even want to accidentally violate them or else there'll be huge fines. And Lebanon is not in a position to pay huge fines. And Lebanon's a tiny country that produces almost nothing. So it needs to trade with people and it can't even trade with its neighbor. So this these suffocating Caesar sanctions on Syria also suffocate Lebanon. Um, it's, there's like, I mean, it's just logical that they would. So this, these sanctions are an attack on the entire region because Syria, this also applies to Iraq. Syria, ha- Iraq has to apply for waivers to trade with its neighbor, Syria, which is ridiculous. It's like, it would be like saying like, you're, we're going to financially penalize the U.S. for doing trade with Canada or Mexico. It's like completely outrageous that the U.S. can just like go to another region of the world and tell people that they can't do trade with neighbors. But that's what's happening as Lebanon's in the midst of this economic collapse. I definitely agree with you on that. It does foster political instability in Lebanon. And, you know, that's just the thing we're at now. Um, I don't know if you heard about like how um, they're trying to like take gas like from Lebanon, remove it to Syria and, and so on. They, we can't we can't even our economic our, our economic trade our trading with Syria is basically non-existent now. And, you know, obviously this is not it's not good at all. Um, I want to I want to also touch up on another point relation to the civil war and the secretarian kind of conflict and the influence of other countries. Well, the civil war was influenced by like every country, um, so many countries. And, you know, I think it's in, I, I actually did a really good interview with um, Assad Abu Khalil, who's a professor in California. And he's such a controversial figure because like people either hate him or love him, but he does know one thing well, whether you hate him or love him. And that is the history of the civil war. And he actually um, frames the civil war as a, an international attack on the Arab left. 
uh, as in like you had Western countries, the U S the French actually, and Israel, Israel directly (laughs) played a role in arming and funding like fascistic Christian parties in Lebanon who were backing these right-wing parties, mostly right-wing Christian parties at the time, Lebanese forces party, the Kataya party, um, and their leaders, they were backing them to essentially fight the Palestinian resistance, which was largely leftist at the time, um, and to fight the allied Lebanese uh, groups that were also largely leftist at the time, really led at the time by the Lebanese communists. Um, And that's actually how this war kind of started out. It started out as an international war to basically wipe out Palestinian resistance and all of the different sort of Arab left tendencies that were armed and militant at the time. And it it worked. Um, It worked to an extreme degree. And as, as that war continued, like, I mean, when you start a war in any country, every neighborhood just kind of turns to its local armed warlords to protect them. Everybody started ethnically cleansing each other and it became a sectarian bloodbath. But I, I mean, I really, I think that framing of the, of the civil war is so inadequate because that's how the West portrays it. They portray it as, oh, like the Lebanese just like hate each other because they're Muslim or Christian. And they all decided to kill each other for 15 years. And that's not how it started. That's not actually what happened. And these countries played a crucial role in literally like arming and funding Christian fascist groups, like Christian ISIS, like is how you can describe. I mean, some of the most vicious groups, the guy I mentioned, Samir Jaja, the head of the Lebanese forces party, he actually went, he's the only person that ever served prison time in Lebanon for committing so many horrific crimes, like more horrific than the other warlords committing so many horrific crimes, not just against other sects, but against other Christian parties, um, just like massacring people himself, like shooting and executing people himself. Uh, and he's still in charge of that party uh, today and is trying, has like put on a suit and trying to portray himself as some statesman. But also the other thing that happened from the civil war is Israel invaded Lebanon on multiple, multiple times, not just once, but the big invasion was in 1982. And this is really when they just crushed the left in Lebanon, crushed the Palestinian resistance. That's like, they ended up leaving like Lebanon and then you had like, and then Palestinians were like massacred after that. Um, But also occupying Southern Lebanon. I mean, people forget Southern Lebanon was occupied by the Israelis and it was brutal, just as brutal as the occupation of Palestine. And that is where, that is what Hezbollah grew out of. Um, Hezbollah grew out of and became popular because they were basically just a bunch of peasants and farmers in the South who like picked up guns and fired back at an organized uh, armed resistance against these Israeli occupiers. And they ultimately succeeded in 2000 in expelling them from Lebanon. So the civil war, international attack on the Arab left, backed by the US, backed by the French, backed by the Saudis, including the Saudis at the time, uh, and backed by the Israelis, and then ultimately is what seeded this movement, Hezbollah in Lebanon, that the US and Saudis and Israelis are trying to crush. Another point, um, do you think that the Taif agreement is as effective as it was meant to be? Although I think it's kind of like, um, it not contradi- it's kind of, it kind of contradicts itself in a way. It's kind of like, It's outrageous to me because it's like we always have to have a third party when we're trying to like patch things up. So it's like the Ta'if is literally, I think, a city in Saudi Arabia. And so we always that's an example of we always have to have some other country making our agreements. Do you think it's as expected as it was meant to be? Well, it depends what you what you think it was meant to do. <laughs> I mean, I think it was meant to keep Lebanon in a per- perpetual state of weakness, of weak governance. Uh, when you have a sectarian based system like the Taf Agreement uh, put up, put, uh, imposed on Lebanon, and you, like you said, Saudi Arabia played a huge role. It wasn't just in Saudi Arabia; they played a huge role in formulating that agreement. Um, and it it has left Lebanon weak. It has left Lebanon with this state of paralysis and clientelism and patronage that we hate. And this goes back to the issue of, like I mentioned how corruption is like this word that the Western countries like to throw in. Oh, Lebanon's just like the indigenous political class in Lebanon is just uniquely corrupt. Like, I guess we don't have corruption in the U.S., you guys. Like, there's no, you know, it's the, the corruption in the U.S. is just lobbying, but it's legal. So we don't call it corruption. 
but in the nepotism in the U S I mean, it's not like we just had a president who like hired his family, um, or like Joe Biden doesn't just like put his son on various boards of big companies. That's not corruption, but Lebanon is uniquely corrupt. The other, the other thing they constantly say is sectarianism. Like Lebanon is naturally sectarian. Uh, this is just the way the country is, you know, Christians, Muslims, Druze, they've always killed each other. They always hated each other. And I would argue like this is, well, this is, we know this is BS. Um, but also this is a system that is imposed on Lebanon to keep it weak. It's, it's, it's literally the same system. A similar system was imposed on Iraq after 2003 for the same reason to keep it weak. You were, you have a sect, like when you have a sectarian based system, every group is have, has like no choice, but to back their communal leaders because they look to them, not just for political representation, but for welfare. What hospital am I going to go to? What school am I going to go to? Like, where am I going to get my ration card? Right. So it gives you all these little mini states inside a bigger state. Um, and it actually helps uh, really like increase corruption in many ways because of that clientele and patronage network. And we really do see something so similar in Iraq. So I think it's absolutely essential that that system be abolished. However, I don't, I still don't think that that is at the center of Lebanon's problems. I really truly believe that. I mean, it's part of Lebanon's problems, but Lebanon's greatest problem is that it's not able to forge a path independent of bigger powers. Like it can't, it can't even trade with its neighbors. It can't even trade with its neighbors because of U.S. sanctions and Saudi blockades. Um, it's so it's just like until that system changes, until Lebanon actually has sovereignty, you, it, it depends what you think is the biggest problem. And I, as a leftist, you know, I think imperialism is the primary contradiction. And until you get rid of that, you almost can't even start to deal with all those local issues that are completely tied up in the imperialist issue. Another topic that I wanted to touch upon was the August 4th Beirut explosion, which was very tragic. I don't know if you were there. I was. I was. There, obviously. I was oh, there. Okay. Tell us about your experience and tell us also about, I guess they were, at the beginning, they were pointing fingers. They're like, oh, it was a drone. Oh, it was Hezbollah because he's sending that um, chem chemical, these chemicals to uh, Syria for whatever's happening with the Assad regime. Like explain to us. So my personal experience, I was really lucky because, you know, there was the electricity at the time was really bad and we didn't have a good building generator. So I actually left my house and went to a friend's house that day uh, because I didn't have electricity. Um, and I'm glad I did because literally the area where I work, there's like windows all over the place and just there was like glass shattered everywhere. So I was really happy not to be home um, and I'm glad I had no electricity. Uh, so I was lucky, but obviously not everybody was. It was really devastating and shocking. And of course, like uh, when it first, like when first we saw the plume of smoke and then the explosion happened, I wasn't like, I think everybody had the same thought, the Israelis bomb, was there a car bomb? Like no one thought a port exploded, but it very quickly became clear that the port exploded. Um, and, you know, there's a few ways to look at this. Like, I think one of the aspects that hasn't been covered enough is what that ammonium nitrate was doing there in the first place. And I think the story that was presented about like a Ukrainian or Russian owned ship going to Mozambique and being stopped in Beirut just sounds ridiculous. Um, and I have been speaking to people, especially in certain like security positions. And what I, from what I understand, and I can only speculate on this for now, but I think what seems most likely is that, you know, you have to consider when this ammonium nitrate was came to Lebanon's port and it was around 2014 and there was a war going on in Syria. Now there has been an attempt without really any evidence to blame this, to blame Hezbollah for like importing it to send to the Syrian government. And the reason I don't think that's plausible is because the Syrian government produces its own ammonium nitrate. They have a huge factory in Homs. Uh, that's actually devastated the environment around it. Um, but it's a, it's a fertilizer factory. So they don't need to import fertilizer through the Beirut port. It just, it's not logistic. It's logistically stupid. And also the Beirut port at the time was really under the control of the future party, um, which as we know now had people in the party who were funneling weapons to the Syrian rebels, uh, some of which they were actually given seed money like Saad Hadidi actually funded a rebel group, although it never really went anywhere because nothing he does really is successful. But he did, fund a, he did fund a rebel group. 
but they were, they had an official in the party who was funneling weapons to rebel groups. So to me, it would make the most sense that perhaps they were going to, uh, uh, import this, uh, ammonium nitrate to send to various rebel groups. And we do know that, uh, non-state actors tend to be the ones that use ammonium nitrate because it's, it's, you, you can use it to make a bomb without, you know, if you can't get a bomb. Um, but that, you know, hasn't been proven either way. So, but I do think that, that, that it's, I, I think that, that it's ridiculous that that hasn't been investigated more, the origins of the ammonium nitrate. And then the other issue is of course it sat there for seven years, right? And that is, I think a product of a dysfunctional, a weak state uh, that is like so unbelievably criminally negligent for a lot of the reasons we talked about earlier. It's a weak state and it's an intentionally weak state. Uh, and for and people also the corruption, people trying to find ways to make money off of it. It was sitting there all this time. Various like people literally wanted to like sell it to make money off of it. And then they couldn't figure out how to. So there's a lot of reasons why it sat there for so long. And as for the explosion uh, investigation, this investigation has been completely politicized. Um, and for, as a result, I don't think that we're gonna get any answers from it. The Western funded NGOs in Lebanon have played a very important role in helping to politicize the Beirut pork blast investigation, which is being led by this judge called Dadak Batar, who very little is known about because he's just kind of like, uh, not really a, a politically involved judge. However, uh, I do know for a fact that he meets with Western embassies quite regularly, which has concerned a lot of the parties who feel they're being targeted. Um, but it's clear to me that this investigation is targeting Hezbollah's allies. So far, the only people who uh, Dadak Bitar has attempted to prosecute, and this is a holdover from the last judge who was in charge of this investigation, are from the ML movement and Marada which are, Meta does a Christian party that's allied with Hezbollah, um, at least for now, it's a part of that coalition. And um, these are of course Hezbollah's allies and, you know, obviously they haven't attacked Hezbollah directly, but Hezbollah feels as though they're being indirectly targeted by this. And then of course, there's like a few people who've been called who aren't affiliated with Hezbollah, like Hassan Diab, who was the prime minister very briefly, I actually think it's really unfair to blame him. He was in charge for like eight months um, and he clearly didn't know what he was doing. And then this official from the future party, Mishnuk, who actually had a falling out with the party. So if the future party doesn't like him anymore. So he's kind of like an easy guy to just throw under the bush. Um, but the point is that it certainly is being politicized. And I don't for a fact that the Germans in particular tried to push for the investigation to be internationalized, much in the same way that they internationalized the Rafiq Hariri investigation uh, into his assassination. And that was used as a way to just kind of indirectly blame Hezbollah without ever blaming them. So that of course has caused huge controversy in the country, uh, depending on which side of the political spectrum people fall on, they have their opinions one way or the other. I definitely agree with that. But, you know, I think the, mo the most horrifying thing is just having, there was a report um, that stated that Michel Aoun, the, pre the current president of Lebanon, he had received a report, I think, sometime maybe in January or June of that, of that year before the bombing. And it was like detailed reporting of you have ammonium nitrate sitting there. Like, how could you not do anything? I mean, it's and not it, just him, a bunch. It's not just him, too. Like, a bunch yeah, of people in here. And so the other thing about this investigation that has been uh, really upsetting is like the people who run Lebanon on the political level are idiots. Like if they receive reports about ammonium nitrate, they probably don't read them. I mean, even Hassan Diab was like, I didn't read it. Like he got a report and he didn't read it. And if they did read it, they might not even know what it means, right? Because it's about some chemical that they don't understand. There is something to be said about the military apparatus in Lebanon, which did nothing, the military intelligence, which did nothing in the, even though they're, they're responsible for certain aspects of the port. Uh, uh, also the uh, judiciary has been left out of being looked into over the investigation, even though it's the judiciary that signed off for the ammonium nitrate being there, but also like a judge might not know what ammonium nitrate means. So I really think that this was something that like, I don't know who you prosecute for this. Like, unless we find out someone was behind lighting it on fire or something for political reasons, which I don't think we'll ever find out if that happened or not. I just don't know who you prosecute unless you just prosecute the entire uh, country because it really is 
Lebanon system that is to blame for what happens, regardless of even how it happened. The problem is Lebanon's system. Exactly. Another point to touch upon are the elections, which I have kind of bad feelings, mixed feelings about, and the role, and we've seen the increased number of registered uh, Lebanese diaspora voters, which is the, an insane amount compared to like 2018. So what are your thoughts on these? And what are your thoughts on those numbers and the possibility of maybe the government excluding the diaspora completely? And what are your thoughts on the actual elections in Lebanon and if something's gonna happen? Because a lot of people are saying something's about to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep hearing people saying that too, though no one's sure what. And I, I mean, I think if there were elections held right now in Lebanon or in a few months from now, I think you're going to see a lot of the same people who are already in charge reelected. Um, you might see like the opposition parties gain one seat or something, uh, but they're not very popular. They don't have a base. Like they're kind of more popular on social media with English and French speakers than they are with Arabic speakers. Um, I think that like, I don't know if the diaspora register, people who registered in the diaspora are enough to actually impact the elections. And I think it's probably not right to assume that they'll all just vote against the current political class. A lot of those people will vote for <laughs> people who are already a part of the political uh, elites. Um, so like I, it's everybody just assumes, oh, the diaspora is going to change the country and vote against who's in charge. But that might not be the case. Um, I the only reason I would think elections wouldn't happen is if there was like something really big would have to happen, like um, like clashes, like bigger than Dayuni kind of clashes. Uh, and that would only happen. I mean, I, I imagine that like it would have to be like the Lebanese, like Saudi Arabia doing something like so the thing is, you have to wonder who doesn't want elections, who stands to benefit, who stands to lose. And the people who stand to lose are the sort of pro West, pro Saudi people. Um, they their power has been diminishing and diminishing and diminishing over the past 20 years in terms of their role in the political in, in politics in Lebanon and how many people vote for them. And it's just like on that same trajectory, whereas Hezbollah's base, unfortunately, ML's base, um, the FPM base, these parties on that side of the coalition, their base supports them. And they're the ones who are left in the country the most. Like a lot of the people leaving Lebanon are from middle and upper middle class households that are a part of the sort of March 14 side of parties, right? Who have the means and money to leave. Whereas uh, the others don't have like a, as much of the means to leave. So like, I think that you're also gonna have a situation where the people who are left who are voting are gonna be pro March 8th and vote for those parties. That's how I see it. I, but I don't know, I can't say like, I, people keep saying elections aren't gonna happen, but we don't know why, but I actually don't know like why they wouldn't. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. I think, I think for me, it's really not just gonna, I'm not just gonna alienate just one political party and be like, oh, they have a lot at stake to lose here. I feel like every single one is just going to hold on to the, to the power that they are trying to grasp to right now. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know. It's like Lebanon is honestly like unpredictable when it comes to this kind of stuff. But you know, I will say, I will say something like everybody talks about the traditional political parties are horrible and they do, they suck, but their bases support them. Like they still support them. I mean, I think For the only reason, person, yeah, yeah the, the only yeah. person who doesn't have that support anymore is Saad Hariri. Like he's just been a complete and utter failure. But like Walid Jimblat is still very popular very, and the, his base is going to come out and vote for him. Um, Hezbollah is still very popular among their base for reasons that actually make sense to me. Uh, they, feel, they feel like they have the most at stake. The ML base, like ML is a party that is kind of like a gang and everybody's employed by it who's in it. And so they have a stake in it, right? Like you get your job through this party, you depend on it being in power for you to continue to have a job. So their base is gonna come out and vote for them. Um, Lebanese forces, their base is gonna vote for them. They don't have a huge base, but the base they have is very enthusiastic. Um, so like the, these parties have a base among the population. And like, so we have to stop like looking at Lebanon as a place that like the officials are only the only problem. Like it's also like the population too. Like the population yes, depends on them. You know, I'm not saying all Lebanese are terrible, but like we have to look at the population and Lebanon is a technically a democratic country and they keep voting for this leadership. And then you have this opposition 
that comes off so disconnected because they're like, no, 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 no. You guys should just all resign and hand power over to us when no one votes for them. It's like actually the most anti-democratic thing to be demanding and asking for. And so when people see that they're turned off and they're like, what can you even do for me? Like, what are you offering me? At least this guy's Mm -hmm. kind of offering me something like materially. So you don't see, see, I, the thing is, is that I agree with you on, on the aspect of how these independent political parties that have emerged, let's say, um, Kuluna Irada, or I think Mintashrin, and the, uh, there are probably a majority of them. I feel like to an, an extent, their mission and their values are good for Lebanon, but how successful will you be in these elections? How are you going to, let's say, try to persuade, not persuade, but try to persuade the people in these other political parties, hey, like we're here to offer you um, independence, um, non-secretarian values, um, try to change Lebanon for the future. But I, I also, at the same time, I argue, I talk about this all the time, the fact that, you know, these political parties will be here for all eternity. They're not gonna move away. And the people who follow them and the people who are loyal to them, they are loyal to them for a reason. And I'm not saying those are bad reasons, but at the same time, When you think of everything that's going on in regards to not only Lebanon, but political interference from outside, it is the hands of the people in Lebanon are the only source of change for that. So they really have to think about it as, are you going to be persuaded by someone who gives you $200 from a political party? Oh, please vote for me. And then nothing changes. Or are you actually going to think about the things that you've been through, such as the Beirut bombing that has devastated every single person in Lebanon, not just in Beirut, or the fact that the public education system in Lebanon is deteriorating, the health, the health system is deteriorating. You literally have no, like, I think I read this article, it was like 65% of Lebanese right now are wanting to flee Lebanon. The, even like probably even more, I don't even know how the, that's accurate, probably even more. So I think that's really. So the political part, the political parties you mentioned, like Minta Shireen and, and Gildo Narazna was kind of, it just, sort of decided it's a political party, but before it was just supporting other parties. But these groups are more attractive to outside people outside Lebanon and in their in Beirut, like middle upper middle class people in Beirut. They don't, they're really, really disconnected from like these are people who like they they do stuff in French and English because that's who they're speaking to. So like that's not the majority of Lebanon. And that they they're not and also like Minta Shireen met like openly with the German embassy and like was proud and did it proudly. And like this also ends up making them suspect to people because they got you, you it's like these people who are part of these groups you got angry when people said that you were uh uh like an arm of embassies. And now you're openly meeting with them and you're doing it proudly and resistance isn't even a part of their rhetoric. Like they don't speak in terms, they speak in terms of neutrality. That's what they say. They say they want to be neutral. How can you be neutral when your country is literally under attack? You are being attacked by Saudi Arabia and by extension, the UAE, the Kuwait, these people are attacking your economy right now. Like they are, they are literally disinvesting from your country and isolating you when your economy is already sinking and you want to be neutral, like, ha- like neutrality is actually taking a side. And this is, I'm, I'm just telling you, this is like, people are passionate in Lebanon, like, yeah. especially the pro-resistance people, they're passionate in Lebanon. They've lost people. They fought and died making sure that ISIS and Al Qaeda didn't come into Lebanon. You know what I mean? They like, they, they fought and died fighting Israelis. What have these opposition groups done? Like, have they died? You know, that, that, that's what the question that people ask. Have you died fighting the Israelis? Like, it's like, they don't, they don't have a base and they are new. So maybe eventually they will have a base, but it doesn't like when I see the people, when I see people in big numbers and I see these groups, it's like, they're so far from each other. They appeal more to Western liberal values uh, than they do to the average Lebanese person who's like, lost everything or, or maybe had nothing. Cause a lot of Lebanon, like we talk a lot about what people lost in banks. A lot of Lebanese didn't have any money in banks. The people who were hurt the most by the economic collapse are middle and upper middle class people. Those are the people who lost their money. There's a huge part of Lebanon that didn't have a life savings. I mean, their lives are of course deteriorating even more but they already lacked electricity. They already lacked all these things. And in many ways the middle and upper middle class 
that speak the language of Western liberal values in this country that revel, you know, want to do revolution, revolution, like the, like their, their economic situation and their lifestyle is deteriorating, but it's actually, what's really happening is for the first time, they're starting to feel the third world like conditions in Lebanon that everybody else in the country felt, except they don't get to have a bubble anymore. And that's, I mean, that's a part of the disconnect. And it's not to say they're all bad. They all have bad intentions. It's like, Mm -hmm. They're just not, they, I, I don't like, they're not connecting with people. And I think it's for those reasons. You know, I we have, I think like a couple of more minutes left, but if I were to close this off, um, I'm going to, I'm going to say a statement real quick and then ask if anyone has any more questions. I really want to stress the fact that we do want independent elections. Like right now, since this is the topic of elections, we want a better Lebanon. We want every single, Le- we want inclusivity for Lebanon. You know, when you were saying that, oh, you know, these independent political parties that are just new and came out of nowhere, they probably were following someone, then they detached themselves. Maybe they're lacking that inclusivity. At the same time, I think to an extent, they are maybe a breath of fresh air for some people. You know, not everyone's going to agree with that. Whether it's Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE, the United States, France, they're they're all trying to get their hands into this mix. I, I believe that with proper mobilization from everyone in Lebanon and from the diaspora, things will change, but it's not going to be an automatic change and it's going to take some time. And I'm pretty sure that you're, you're with me on this, that Lebanon is an amazing country and it doesn't deserve, and does it, does it deserve to what everyone, what's happening right now with the people? And we don't deserve to live through this at all. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else and, and closing off, I really, first I want to ask if anyone does have any questions or comments, you can put that in the chat. I did see that there were some comments and I am very much appreciative of, of that. If anyone does have any questions, you can put that right now. But if you do not, Rania, I really want to thank you for this discussion. I enjoyed your discussion. Even if I might not have maybe I agreed with some tiny points, this is what having a civilized discussion is about. And I feel that's lacking in Lebanon because in Lebanon, when someone, let's say, let's say when someone says, see, like we, we, we support, um, Bashar al-Assad or we support Hezbollah and maybe they don't 100% agree with every single point of why you um, support them. I can see from your point of view and you know this is what Lebanon is lacking. The Lebanese people are lacking this type of conversation where you don't go ahead and scream at someone just because you disagree with them on tiny points. You know we're having this conversation because we care about Lebanon and that's what unites us all together and I really want to thank you for this discussion again and thank you for having to accommodate for our time difference because I know it's pretty late in no worries no worries i'm happy to do it anytime and i appreciated this this was wonderful thank you thank you thank you for introducing new points of views even if not necessarily i agreed with it i definitely appreciated that different point of view thank you so much thank you i really appreciate it thank you everyone for tuning in have a nice day have a nice night actually and have a nice night too bye bye bye